War crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, the most serious offences in international law. But what about crimes against our planet Earth? Ecocide, here on Roundtable. And hello from me, David Foster. The destruction of wonderful natural environments so serious that polluting company bosses should face international justice, it is said. Now, that's a theory being pursued by one group of legal campaigners. The problem is they need to change international law to do that. The Earth is suffering the effects of climate change and so far good intentions haven't been enough. So one group of campaigners says it's time for a new international law to protect the planet. Ecocide is the loss, damage or destruction of ecosystems, including climate and cultural damage. The movement to turn it into a law was led by Polly Higgins, a leading barrister who died earlier this year, after dedicating the last years of her life to the campaign. This isn't a fight for me, it's an invitation to engage with a very different way of understanding law. The central idea is to add ecocide to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, recognising it along genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Companies and governments could become criminally responsible for mass destruction that contributes to ecocide. Higgins had been working with the Pacific island nation of Vanuatu, which has the right to table an amendment to the Rome Statute but convincing dozens of nations to change international law will be far from straightforward. So let's get talking to, first of all, Thomas McManus, lecturer in state crime at Queen Mary University. Also here, Joe Domechta from the Stop Ecocide campaign. Ellie Mulholland joins us. She heads the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative at Oxford University. And Martin Crook here too from Roehampton University where he researches ecocide. Uh, listen, great to have you all here. We mentioned Polly Higgins in, in the package that we just saw. You were great friends with her. She was the person who really defined ecocide. Why and how? <laughs> uh, Polly gave up a very lucrative career as a UK barrister um, at a sort of epiphany moment where she asked herself, you know, how can we create a legal duty of care for the earth? And she started researching it. Uh, and what she discovered uh, was that when the Rome Statute, which is the governing document for the International Criminal Court, was originally drafted, there was a crime of ecocide in there, but it got dropped out at the last minute. And Polly then dedicated the rest of her life to reinstating that missing Unfortunately, she died crime. earlier this year. She was only 50. She's been doing this for 10 years, yeah? Absolutely. The last decade of her life was completely dedicated <clears throat> to taking forward the concept and the promotion of uh, an amendment of ecocide to international law, making it an international crime. Um, and for her, this was an absolute life mission. She submitted, as a lawyer, she submitted a definition to the UN Law Commission back in 2010 um, of ecocide as serious loss, damage, or destruction of ecosystems of a given territory. And that was tested. That was tested in a mock trial in 2011 in the UK Supreme Court. And it was shown to be viable as a, a criminal law. But in reality, though, um let me ask you, Thomas, is anybody really listening on the legal side of things? It sounds like a great campaign, but is it going to go anywhere? Uh, I think people are listening. I think especially recently we've seen in the UK that people are listening to uh, the issues and people are looking around now for some sort of strong legal way to stop what is going to be a disaster. Um, and our, our problem probably is international criminal law works on a kind of a uh, a slow pace. Um, I, I use the Genocide Treaty as an example where the Genocide Treaty was, was developed for the prevention of genocide uh, as much as for the punishment, yes. uh, but we've seen real problems with preventing genocide. W what we see is it's, it's really loaded the other way and 20 years later we see people punishment for crimes of genocide. We don't really have 20 years in this situation, so we need a, a different way of bringing this international and, and, and I in. also suppose that, it, I, and I know the International Criminal Court has its critics, and it is very slow and it's not always successful. Part of the problem here is that while you might be able to identify genocide, you can see conflict, 
in this case, if you're trying to pin the blame for destroying the planet on particular individuals, um, I mean, it's going to be much more difficult, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so in the climate litigation that we're seeing already under domestic law, because we've already got uh, over 1,300 cases that have been brought worldwide that raise issues of law or fact relating to climate change and the climate emergency, as we're now calling it. And um, not all of those are about this accountability um, angle, but those cases, uh, legal causation is um, often often a difficult one and uh, courts... The you mean justice who's to blame? Is that what that means? Uh, does the thing that the defendant did cause the harm and connect yeah. that in a legal way that in the way the tests that and that are, is are almost impossible to pin on people at the moment you're finding is that right uh, so it's not impossible we're seeing actually really um, uh, litigants are bringing really novel cases so to apply this climate paradigm to existing law and so one of the ways in which um, uh, causation is being tested in the courts is uh, through um, not what we traditionally call but for causation. That's very loyally termed to say if this didn't happen, then that. Um, but using things like uh, the Carbon Majors Project, which the Ecoside um, Initiative has really uh, picked up on, but that's already being tested in domestic uh -huh. courts in Germany. So why do we need an Ecoside law if we already have? these other abilities to be able to prosecute and pursue on behalf of Mother Nature, our planet? Well, I think it's important to establish um, in terms of international law um, the ability to establish universal jurisdiction. So it, with, with genocide and other crimes against humanity, we have um, the power and the reach of law that no one can escape, in theory at least, whether it's heads of states, uh, high-ranking state officials and so I think the importance of the ecocide law is to be able to make criminally responsible those powerful actors that are largely responsible for the, the, the lion's share of ecological destruction. And the point that Martin raised I think is important, it's about the universal jurisdiction. The ICC may have had failures in the past but it is only a complementary court, it's only supposed to step in when states themselves don't actually prosecute the crimes. So if we have a universal jurisdiction, we don't have to rely upon the crime having been committed in our country or the company being based in our country that has carried out the crime. We can prosecute a crime that's happened anywhere by anyone using the domestic system. Martin talks about, about the powerful involved in this, and this is for any one of you to answer, or all of you, if you like. But the powerful are, in a sense, almost trying to prevent this from happening because I think you found when you went to even NGOs, mm. when, when you went to powerful countries, they sort of said, no, no, I'm sorry, we're not interested. And you had to turn to the smaller players. That's absolutely right. I mean, um, Polly realized a number of years ago that the big players, um, the oil states like ourselves here in the UK, are not likely to be first movers on making this amendment and indeed uh, were instrumental in it not becoming law in the first place. But I think there's some important distinctions to make with a crime of ecocide um, as compared to, say, genocide or uh, war crimes. Ecocide is, more than anything, it's a corporate crime. So it's not a state, you're not looking so much, I mean, of course, a lot of the big companies, big oil companies have, are state-sponsored or state-owned, but you're essentially looking at business. And bringing in a law of ecocide the power of it, of course, the power and the excitement of it lies in potential trials in many ways. You know, we, you know, we could have fossil fuel bosses, pesticide bosses, and so on in the dock. That's very exciting, having that um, responsibility to call on. But the real excitement, I think, around ecocide is its ability to prevent. Because once something becomes illegal, then insurers can't insure it, backers can't invest in it, um, and, and so you end up with a, a very strong steer for industry. Martin, you, would, you, you're nodding at that, right? Yeah, I, I would also add, though, I think it's important that if we do manage to pass the crime of ecocide as an international crime, that we make it a matter of strict liability so that it's possible to... So we don't get caught up in the imbroglio of trying to establish intent, mens rea, which was something that bedeviled the genocide convention. This is one an area of research of mine as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, and in fact, if you look at the, the history of the genocide convention, it's a, it's a useful analog, because in fact, throughout the, the history of the UN system, ecocide was considered as um, an element that should be grafted on to the genocide convention. 
Uh, and then mysteriously, and this is, this is an area of research that we're doing at the School of Advanced Study, mysteriously, it disappeared. It was come back to, to what Jojo was saying here, that the, 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 the Set of interested parties, those with particular right. interest, made sure that so it didn't get it. I mean, and when we come to crimes of the powerful, again, we go back to the, the, the drafting of the Rome Statute. It's interesting to say ecocide was, was moot at the time. The other thing that was moot at the time was organizational crimes, so that you could prosecute an organization. You don't have to look for the mental element of the crime. And at the time, there was just such a, uh, uh, some people hadn't have never heard of that idea that you could prosecute a corporation, because it's very difficult to identify who made it the actual decision in these organizations. It's the organization itself that but needs to be But we do have the crime account. of corporate manslaughter, well, et cetera. We have the, the Corporate Manslaughter Act in the UK, where you can go after the corporation itself and yeah. individuals <laughs> for criminal responsibility. Uh, we haven't actually used it Okay. Yes, so that okay. might point to some of the problems. Ellie, sorry, I've, I've left you out on the limb for, for a little while. In, in terms of the legal position about getting a, a law of ecocide passed, how would you go about it? Where, where, where would you turn to if it's already been kicked out in the original Rome Statute? Oh. I will, OK, you may Actually, want to do it, but I do want to give Ellie I, a chance. <laughs> I've, I've got to comment on the prevention point, but yeah. I could um, leave that question for Jojo first. Go on. <laughs> well, the, the way that the procedures in the International Criminal Court work is that any member state can actually propose an amendment. Um, it's one of the few forums in the world where the small players have as much power as the big economies to make a difference um, and to actually propose an amendment. Um, and the beauty of it is that once that amendment is actually on the table, there is no veto, which means you can abstain, but you can't actually vote against it. It means that it get ratified over time, and once you have two thirds of the members of the International Criminal Court are signed <laughs> up, that becomes law, and that's very exciting. You know, I don't it's know actually how many, achievable. I don't know how many times on this program I've said there's a big but here, uh, yeah. and, and that is the United States is not a signatory to the International Convention. It's one of the biggest, if you like, it's accused on many occasions of being one of the biggest perpetrators of uh, egocide. I want to get Ellie in, in, mm. in here. In, in terms, you want to talk about prevention, did you? Yeah, I think actually, so picking up on a few comments from Jojo about the power of an ecocide law, if it were to exist in international criminal law, it would be a really powerful um, uh, determinant of uh, beha changing behaviours now. Um, but then how difficult it would be for a law of ecocide to come into existence. Um, so therefore, people are looking at existing laws under domestic law. So at the CCLI, we do legal research on um, what, climate, what the climate emergency being a financial risk issue and financial stability issue, what that means under existing laws. So particularly directors' duties and pension fund trustees' duties. And there's a real similar thread there because looking at the potential for future liability and personal liability as well, because that is a really powerful driver of change within corporates. Can, can, I, can I try and simplify this? Yeah. So what you're saying is, is that there could be a big corporation that causes some kind of environmental disaster. Let, let, let's go back to deep water, mm -hmm. um, Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it causes an environmental disaster. I saw it for myself. Um, and you would then, under the laws that exist in particular jurisdictions, you, you, you as a pension trustee, you as a senior shareholder would automatically or could automatically be held responsible? Not automatically, but the existing laws and procedural mechanisms exist. So perhaps an example might um, make this a bit clearer. So a Californian utility, PG&E, so they own the poles and wires in California. They um, uh, went into bankruptcy in January this year after the devastating wildfires that um, we saw for two years in California that were just unprecedented in terms of the, the power of the wildfires and then the tragic loss of life. And so then the company went into bankruptcy and now a bunch of both shareholders um, and also creditors are suing the board um, and uh, because when companies go into um, bankruptcy, they're looking for somewhere to, um, to recoup their losses. And so PG&E um, directors and officers who were supposed to manage the, um, the risks of uh, wildfires, so particularly around vegetation, um, and climate so change. So they, they, they us could well be held responsible. Yeah, so climate change this. is telling us, is connecting right. the dots. Who wants to talk about Vanuatu? Because we mentioned the, yeah, oh, the, the oh, smaller oh, nations absolutely. in this. Absolutely. Vanuatu, Pacific Island, 
taking up some kind of case I, against uh, who Well, and I think what? we need to look here at, I mean, you were talking about what's realistic to put in place and, you know, how things currently work at the moment. The reality at the moment is that what we have right now in terms of civil law simply isn't working. You know, I mean, we've seen the rise of, um, you know, climate movements such as Extinction Rebellion, such as the youth strikes, bringing to the public attention the drastic nature of the situation we face. You know, in our work with Ecoside Law, when the IPCC report came out last year, we had a sudden jump These in attention. These are climate change talks, yes, just for those who don't understand. No, no the, <clears throat> the report that was brought out saying we had 12 years to act if we were going to keep within 1.5 degrees. So suddenly people are like, wow, this is actually really coming. This is, this is really serious. <clears throat> and then with Extinction Rebellion and the sudden rise in attention that's come with that, you know, people are really calling for something very specific to do. And actually, what's realistic in the face of, you know, the extinction of life on this earth? What's realistic is actually stopping the harm. Can we talk about this? Gonna, can we, can, no, 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 seriously, I've, I've got to direct this to some extent. <laughs> Um, let's talk about specifics, because you talk about the difficulties of, of getting where you, you yeah. would like to go to. I mentioned Vanuatu. Absolutely. Smaller let's nation talk about where um, it's in going. danger. Yes, give uh, us absolutely. the specifics. Yeah, so the people who are suffering already from this situation are the small climate vulnerable states, such as Vanuatu and other Pacific islands, which are already going underwater, you know, which are already so what seeing, are they doing? Um, you know, they're, what they're doing is they're already threatening publicly to sue fossil fuel companies. Um, for the climate breakdown damage that is not mm. of their own making. Sounds a bit vague. Um, to climate change, you know, well, fossil it's, fuel it's, companies. I mean, is there a specific the... case out there? Not yet. Um, from, from those islands, although, as, as Ellie pointed out, there are actually well over a 1,000 cases going on worldwide. But I think what we have to realise here is that climate mitigation is a bit like mopping the floor with the tap running. You're saying, you, can, you, you know, all of this damage has been done and now you've got to pay for it. Actually, what we need to be doing is saying, how do we stop? the harm. And so we need to be, if you like, unreasonable. I mean, what is reasonable and proportionate in this situation is not How do you be unreasonable situation. in this situation other than follow the example of Extinction Rebellion, perhaps? And I mean, that wasn't too extreme. Well, it's certainly worked, hasn't it? It's certainly woken people up and yeah. it's had the government... And we, and we need to think about, off as well. We need to think about the type of harms that we want laws to protect. Do we want the law to protect against harm, economic harm? Human rights is another way of doing it. Humans are, you know, connected to the planet in a way that we could say that damaging the planet is actually damaging people. Mm -hmm. Or are we directing it at the planet itself? Are we saying that damage to the planet is what should be the crime? And, and we have to think about pragmatically what can we do in 12 years with the law that's already in place. Well, so yeah, a lot then, of then you have to, to define what is damage, and so and it becomes incredibly complex. Well, I'm trying to find out if, if this is anything more than just a great idea or whether it's mm. actually going somewhere. That's why I mentioned Vanuatu. I understand. Legal case doesn't seem to be, you know, against some fossil fuel companies. What about suing Shell? Well, I mean... Now that's um, happening, isn't it? There's actually yes, a, cla Martin, there's a class that. action going on in Holland at the moment, actually, yeah. um, against Shell. Um, and, you know, our legal team is actually working on a test prosecution case um, against the CEOs of Shell. Um, for climate ecocide and what we're examining and this is by no means a foregone conclusion but what we're examining is whether or not that can be fit under crimes against humanity with existing provisions now if it can obviously that's a very powerful tool but if it can't well it's a very clear um, indicator that yeah. there is missing law here I, I just wanted to say I think I mean as, as a scholar of genocide as well I think um, the problem is that power has to be taken into consideration. The, the realities are the structures of power. And if you think about the passing of the Genocide Convention, it, it was done in the shadow of one of the greatest atrocities of the 20th century, if not of all history. And so my fear is that something equivalent will have to happen in terms of the environment and ecological destruction for the political will to be there to force it. It might be states. too late then. And it might be too but late. But that's where we perhaps, can't wait yeah. for that. And it's, it's the same with war crimes, the same with crimes against humanity. The, these international crimes came from some sort of calamity that humans stood up and mm. said, oh, we have to do something so that doesn't happen again. But we don't have the benefit this time of looking back and saying we don't want that to happen again. So we have to change our mindset to, to see the disaster coming. Uh, uh, what needs to happen next then? What do you think? Um, in terms of changing behaviour now within corporates, it really is about the materiality of the risk. So when we speak to directors um, and senior executives, it's really show me the case. It's not the legal theory. It's um, it's How much show it hurts me the case. Them. Yes, and but it's um, both in terms of the consequences and the bottom line. Yes, so it's it's personal it's uh, personal liability. It's the bottom line of their company. 
Um, and But it's really about is this threat of litigation and this threat of pr prosecution um, and liability, is it real, is it material to them? And for that to be material, it has to be not just does the law exist, um, it's is it being used? Uh, we don't even actually necessarily need to see, uh, so the climate litigation that's already underway is businesses taking note uh, even before we get to uh, uh, in, even before judgment, we're really seeing, uh, particularly getting through a procedural hurdle, a motion to dismiss. That's a really powerful sign that this is credible. So, so it's really show me the case. Okay, so so every year you and your group team. go to war, the International Criminal Court's annual meeting. Correct. Let's put it this way, and make some kind of of point. This year, following the death of uh, Polly, the founder of the group, what will the point be that you're making this year? It's going to be about raising the profile. We will be partnering with Vanuatu, who have publicly stated that they're working with us. Um, and it will be raising the profile of the idea of crime of ecocide and the possibility of, of that um, becoming a reality, as well as working with others um, towards you know, a kind of um, a range of different approaches to dealing with the climate emergency uh, and you know, criminal law being an important part of that. So that is actually, you know, so already in motion. So raise the profile, what are you going to do? Well, <laughs> the way that these things work is, um, is uh, obviously as a member of the International Criminal Court, you're allowed to present and to give speeches. And we've actually um, accompanied um, Pacific Island states to the, um, to the International Criminal Court Conference over the last three years. Um, for the Pacific Islands, this is a new thing because war crimes and genocide were not considered to be hugely relevant to them. But when you bring ecocide in and they're at the sharp end of suffering it, then, of course, it becomes a lot more interesting. Um, and so they're interested in raising their profile in that context, as they already have at the COP talks. Um, and the only reason we have an international criminal court is because Trinidad and Tobago proposed it themselves. So it came from a small island nation in the first place. So. It, it, as you say, it is the small players do have a greater role in that kind of form. Yeah. Change coming from the margins. It's <laughs> worth noting as well the history of it because with the uh, proposal to the International Law Commission to actually add ecocide to the draft codes and add it to the Rome Statute, so it would become the fifth crime against peace, um, one of the members of the uh, commission who were asked to study the proposal when asked in an interview why it was re ultimately removed, because it was m mysteriously removed by the chair, the proposal, uh, he concluded it could only be down to uh, new basically the interests of states uh, who want to use nuclear, tech nuclear power, nuclear weapons. This is something we have to consider. And I think, I think the ecocide law, whether it's passed or not, will be a necessary but not sufficient condition. Well, is, is it going to be? What do you think? I, I think uh, with the groundswell of struggle and resistance against ecological destruction that we're seeing here and, and around the world, uh, I think once, once it inevitably reaches a crit critical threshold, mm. it will. Be I, I, I know the, the price that would be paid if something drastic doesn't happen it is almost too awful to contemplate. But talking of prices, look at the cost of every case at the International Criminal Court. Somebody's going to say, we just can't afford to do this. And we can't afford to be drawn into economic arguments about it. If you look at the history of, you know, every great human freedom that's been won, it's mm. never been won on e economic arguments. When you look at slavery, when you look at the suffragettes, when you look mm. at the civil rights mm. movement, when you look at um, gay marriage, I mean, you know, all these major freedoms that have been won, they've always been a combination of a grassroots movement, a really yeah. strong grassroots movement, and legal changes, legal cases. It's never been an economic reason. In fact, with the abolition of slavery, there were many companies that absolutely railed against it. But given a period of transition, given a roadmap to do it, actually none of them went out of business. Business will move very fast if you give it a steer. And in fact, I think even the very first struggles against, even within the, it, to use a historical point, the Industrial Revolution, the first uh, peasants who rebelled against the Industrial Revolution were actually rebelling against the ecological breakdown of the environments they had to work in, according to Andreas Malm, who wrote the book Fossil oh, Code. I think, I think the movement has to come from below, and we've seen that from the nuclear weapons case. Uh, it, nuclear weapons, because of the damage they were caused, uh, particularly to the environment as well, if used, were made illegal by the uh, International Court of Justice. But that has had no effect on countries' possession of nuclear weapons mm. as well. So we have to take that as a warning about 
what states will do, even with placed with the, the, yeah. the illegality of their actions. It has to come from below. People have to force their governments to, to take Joe, this Joe, on. I'm, just as um, Polly's probably best friend uh, in this line of things, what would she think the most important thing to do next would be if she were still alive and leading the ecocide movement? Well, she would be doing what we're doing, which is continuing with the legal and diplomatic strategy, but absolutely raising awareness and inviting everyone to become earth protectors, if you like. The Stop Ecocide campaign is, is about everyone protecting the earth because we're all part of that. You know, we can't survive without our planet. You know, we, we, we live and breathe and eat, you know, what is created by the planet around us. Listen, thank you very much indeed. In a sense, turn off the tap, but keep the tap turned on so we can all <laughs> uh, live, eat and drink. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for coming on the program. Um, I'm so pleased we got around to talking about it. It only came about from my point of view, because I, I read an obituary of Polly Higgins and it mentioned the movement. Um, if it's done any good highlighting it here on this program, uh, I think uh, we've achieved our aim. I hope you achieve yours. Thank you very much. Me, David Foster and the team. Goodbye for now. <laughs>